Whenever the economy stumbles, a lot of people in Washington argue that government spending should be increased in order to inject money into the economy. In this Center for Freedom and Prosperity video, we're going to look at whether this policy makes sense. I'm Dan Mitchell of the Cato Institute, and we're discussing this issue because government is big now, and there's a lot of agitation to make it even bigger, ostensibly, to improve growth. First, some background. During the 1930s, America was suffering from a deep downturn. An economist named John Maynard Keynes argued that the economy could be boosted if the government borrowed money and spent it. According to this approach, which is now known as Keynesianism, this new spending would put money in people's pockets and the recipients of the funds would then spend the money. This would, according to the theory, prime the pump as the money began circulating through the economy. The Keynesians also said that some tax cuts, particularly lump sum rebates, could have the same impact since the purpose is to have the government borrow and somehow put money in the hands of people who will spend it. So is this the right recipe to boost a flagging economy? Let's first look at whether Keynesianism makes sense from a theoretical perspective and then look at the real world evidence. Keynesian theory sounds good and it would be nice if it made sense, but it has a rather glaring logical fallacy. It overlooks the fact that in the real world, government can't inject money into the economy without first taking money out of the economy. More specifically, the theory only looks at one half of the equation, the part where government puts money in the economy's right pocket. But where does the government get that money? It borrows it, which means it comes out of the economy's left pocket. There is no increase in what Keynesians refer to as aggregate demand. Keynesianism doesn't boost national income, it merely redistributes it. The pie is sliced differently, but it's not any bigger. The people who lend the money to government generally are not the same people who get money in their pockets because of the new spending or, or tax rebates, but that's not important. The Keynesian theory is based on the notion that there will be an increase in overall available cash, yet that clearly is not the case. Some advocates of this theory get a bit more creative and say that Keynesianism works because it increases consumer spending rather than the money sitting idle. But money that is unspent by consumers does not sit idle. It winds up in the banking system someplace and is used to finance investment spending. The really clever Keynesians then respond by saying people won't lend and borrow in a weak economy. But in that type of dismal economic environment, people are so fearful that they try to increase their savings so the bulk of any so-called stimulus winds up in the banking system anyway. Before shifting from theory to evidence, we should quickly note that government could finance stimulus spending by printing money rather than borrowing. Thankfully, that option doesn't seem to be on the table since almost all politicians now realize that it would be foolish to mimic the disastrous inflationary policies of basket case economies such as Argentina and Zimbabwe. Looking now at the real world evidence, it's even more clear that Keynesianism is a failure. Let's go back to the Great Depression. In his four years, Herbert Hoover was a poster boy for statism. He increased taxes dramatically, including a boost in the top tax rate from 25% to 63%. He imposed harsh protectionist policies. He significantly increased intervention in private markets. And most important, at least from a Keynesian perspective, he boosted government spending by 47% in just four years. And he certainly had no problem financing that spending with debt. He entered office in 1929 when there was a surplus, and he left office in 1933 with a deficit of 4.5% of GDP. So how did Hoover's big government Keynesian experiment work? As the chart shows, growth went down and unemployment went up. Unfortunately, other than being a bit more reasonable on trade, Roosevelt followed the same approach. The top tax rate was boosted to 79%, and government intervention became more pervasive. Government spending, of course, skyrocketed, rising by 106% between 1933 and 1940. But this big government approach didn't work for Roosevelt any better than it did for Hoover. Unemployment remained very high throughout the 1930s, and overall output did not get back to the 1929 level until World War II. Other Keynesian episodes generated similarly dismal results. 
though fortunately never as bad as the Great Depression. Gerald Ford did a Keynesian stimulus focused on tax rebates in the mid-1970s. The economy did not improve, but why would it? After all, borrowing money from one group and giving it to another group does nothing to increase economic output. As we've explained in other videos, tax cuts only boost the economy if they reduce the tax penalty on work, saving, and investment, i.e. lower tax rates, not gimmicks. More recently, George W. Bush gave out so-called rebate checks in 2001 and 2008, yet both times there was no positive effect. And he certainly was a big spender, yet that didn't work either. Not that this should be a big surprise. Even left-wing international bureaucracies are producing research showing that bigger government hurts economic performance by misallocating national resources. Indeed, if you want to get a survey of the literature paper reviewing this evidence showing that big government means less growth, just send an email to the address on the screen. The international evidence also shows the foolishness of Keynesianism. The most obvious example may be Japan, which throughout the 1990s tried to use so-called stimulus packages to jumpstart a stagnant economy. But the only thing that went up was Japan's national debt, which more than doubled during the decade, and now is far above even Italy when measured as a share of GDP. The economy, as represented by this chart showing Japan's Nikkei stock market average, remained in the dumps. Let's end this video by asking a simple question. If Keynesian spending doesn't make sense from a theoretical perspective and also fails every time it is tried in the real world, why do politicians keep trying the same approach? Your guess is as good as mine, but I suspect that politicians just love to spend other people's money and Keynesianism is a convenient rationale. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, thanks for watching. Don't forget to share this video widely. If enough people understand the truth, maybe politicians will finally do the right thing and help the economy by reducing the burden of government rather than increasing it.